So what's our format today? Coaching session? Record it. Yes. Yes. So um, this is fun. Um, I uh, love to be doing this with you. And obviously, like, it can be edited, but it still feels live-ish. Um, I and prefer not to edit. I think it's good to have all the little stuff. I mean, unless we really fuck up, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I'm not into over editing at all, but, um, <laughs> just in case you're like, Oh shit, I did not mean to say that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the format is just that we pick up from where we left off last week. Um, I've done some of my work and I have additional questions and, um, that this introduces my clients and my circle to you and your style and um, your brilliance and it's good for everybody. I love it. All right, then we better start with some accountability. What, <laughs> what were you assigned and what did you do about it? Okay. Um, I took a ton of notes last time we talked and my actions were to one, design an internal standard for the kinds of work that Radius accepts and how we want to show up in the world. Um, and for that one, I pulled off this little sticky note that has been right above my computer for I don't know how long. And Radius values is sort of how I was thinking about it. But the words there are veracity, tenacity, humility, rabid curiosity, fierce accountability. And did I say empathy? Um, that these are the qualities that I feel like I bring that are the standards for my business. And when I look for other contractors um, to work with me, even though I haven't been running through this checklist, there are people that bring these traits to the work that they do. Yeah. And that collectively, we're not showing up because we think we're the experts, even though we have expertise. We're showing up because of this belief in seniors that collectively between us and the clients that we work with, something really amazing evolves, um, which in my mind is part of the difference between folks who identify as coaches and folks that identify as consultants. That, that we're really there believing that the clients that we work with have their own solutions and that our job is to help clarify that with them, not for them. Okay, so those are your values. And I don't know if you've also done something where you kind of write out what it means, but since it's just you, it's fine if you know what you mean by those things. But how does yeah. that translate to the kind of clients you want to work with? that the part, the clients, the partners that we work with would also value these things. Um, the veracity, for example, that we are not, if you just want us to show up and tell you how awesome you are, um, we will do that, but we will also not be afraid to say things that are hard for you to hear. Um, that that if, if you want us to pull punches, that we're probably not the right right uh, coaches and consultants for you that that we believe in growth and we believe in learning and we believe in leaning into hard conversations and conflict um, and that covers the gamut right like you might not hire us to um, provide equity and inclusion training because that's not our expertise but if I'm recognizing a real misuse of power or if you're saying really stupid things that you don't understand and your ignorance is incredibly racist or non-inclusive, I'm going to be talking with you about that. So there needs to be this level of openness and that ties in with the humility as well. Um, so that's part of our discovery process then in, in identifying the clients that will be most receptive to the style and expertise that we bring. I'm curious, how do you suss that out when you're in like the prospect prospecting phase, right? Because obviously in the course of your actual work, 
things are going to come up. It's like, I always think of when you're going in to remodel a house and it's just like, oh, patch up that wall. And then you go to the wall yeah. and you see there's like asbestos and mold inside it. <laughs> so like, how do you do that assessment? Yeah, that's a great analogy. And um, clearly you do this work as well, because <laughs> as you know, the need that clients typically come with is not the root of it's a symptom right they bring mm -hmm. us symptoms and yeah. then it takes a while to actually find what the cause is so you yeah. can't see the asbestos at first inspection that's totally true how do i do that um i've done this work long enough that i've gotten much much better at assessing narcissism out of the gate which yeah. <laughs> is a pretty key indicator that coaching is not going to go very well Right. Um, that the kinds of questions that I ask in those early discovery, you know, um, what are your primary goals? What have you already tried to address this problem? Where do you think you're getting in your own way? That, that we're able to assess how critical of a thinker they are, that yeah. we're able to assess, are they blaming everyone else for the problem or are they... I'm looking for a level of self-awareness. And if my client has really low self-aware, a potential client has really low self-awareness, it doesn't mean that we can't do the work, um, but it means that the way that I'm going to scope it or talk about it is going to be different. Yeah, I think it's perfectly acceptable that you <laughs> have a good instinct because you've been doing this so long. I know when I first started um, as my own business, I like the signs were there, but I didn't see them because I was like, I need the business. And, and mm -hmm. then about a few years in, like, I would have the instinct, like, don't work with this person. And then <laughs> I would ignore it and it inevitably would be a shit show. And so then I had to start actually listening. But now, like, mm -hmm. in the first five minutes, I'm like, oh, <laughs> this isn't gonna work. Right, absolutely. And I think I have certainly, as I've aged and as I've had negative experiences and as I've done lots of therapy, get better at that read and that gut instinct. Yeah. And I think I've talked about this with you and home team that in those, in that first coffee date or lunch date or first hour with a potential client, my biggest cue is how does my body feel at the end of the meeting? Like at the end of a Ciara meeting, I always feel really energized and I feel expansive and that you've like given me lots of things to think about and I feel really connected. And that's not just because we have a relationship. I think that people that would sit down with you to have lunch for the first time would get that Ciara buzz. And if my nervous system doesn't feel attracted to, not, um, and you know, attracted to so often takes on a sexual connotation. But if, if my nervous system doesn't feel safe and pleasantly activated and doesn't have me sort of pinging, then I'm probably not going to be able to access my best self to do the best work with whoever that client is. And I've just used that gut check long enough that it's reliable for me. Yeah, that's something I admire a lot about you because you also um, have a good uh, base sense of enoughness. Like you're not desperate mm -hmm. for the business and you know that the right business will come because both because it just will and because you've been doing it long enough and because your work speaks for itself and yeah. because you're doing mm -hmm. your business development in the meantime, right? Yeah. Whereas a lot of people aren't. Uh, right. Yeah. So, so as far as internal standards, yes, I understand what those words mean to me, but at, because I work with so many subcontractors and want to grow that aspect of my business, I understand it is important to write those out and get clear definitions and um, socialize those with the people that I work with. And, you know, if you ever were to be sharing business development with somebody, you know, if you contracted somebody to do some of your sales or something, that's when you would want to maybe define it. Um, but I can't imagine a situation where you wouldn't meet the client in advance unless you were being subcontracted. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and also, 
having these in some format that I present to clients too. This is the business. This is who Radius is. And these are, this is how we operate. And so you can expect to see these values in our work together. And then that that creates a conversation where they're like, what do you mean by tenacity? Um, And, you know, that word in particular I, it goes exactly to an engineer that I worked with many, many years ago that when, we, uh, when I did a 360 interview for him and the word that continually came up to describe his leadership was tenacious. And it so described him. And I so loved that quality in him, right? Like part of it is that like he has a dog, he's a dog with a bone. And once he has an idea, he does not let go. And the shadow side of that is that maybe that means we're stubborn. Um, or that we could be inflexible, but I see it more as um, that unwillingness to give up and to press on and to be resilient. And so tenacity for me enables that engineer's quality that I really admire. Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm looking back at my notes and I'm seeing that, um, the original assignment was define standards of being a woke business. And, and I know that like a couple of years ago, you're thinking like, I don't want to work with anyone who like is racist or sexist or anything. And like, of course, none of us would, but at the same time, like you're the firefighter, like it's, you know, you're the coach, it's your job to go in there and help them improve. And so, um, I think both, if we're really committed to the service aspect of that work, you don't have the luxury of only working with those people. And um, you're also like one of the best suited to help the people who need to level up. Maybe you're not working with people who are starting at zero Mm -hmm. and trying to take them to 10, but maybe you're looking for the like five, six, sevens and taking them to eight, nine, tens. So I think, you know, having some flexibility around where people are, you know, they're not, they're not doing it perfectly yet. Um, And no one is ever going to be doing it perfectly in terms of the interpersonal, but, um, but a willingness to operate in that space of self interrogation and improvement and and have a growth Mm -hmm. mindset. Is that what I think you're getting at? Yes. And, and this is why it's so important for both client and coach to take notes, right? Because me leaving out a woke business is a pretty um, important <laughs> element of that. And, and to use your own words that um, I would not self-identify as a woke business, but your words of awakening um, that I am continually working at becoming an anti-racist business. And that that work is never done. And certainly I'm not in a position to say my business is woke and I'm looking for your business. Is your business Mm -hmm. woke or not? Because um, I am in no position to judge that. It's Mm -hmm. it's whether or not are you as a potential client, as a business owner, interested in leaning in to doing more equitable, justice-oriented work. And if the primary goal is we want to be more equitable and inclusive, I'm not taking the lead on that work because that's not my primary area of expertise. But I do believe that understanding our own fuckery and how that gets in the way is gonna absolutely show up in how we create inclusive cultures. Because if my fuckery is that I get really defensive, when anyone gives me hard feedback, then I'm going to have a really hard time talking about race and um, discrimination and harassment, et cetera. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, while anti-racism is like the primary conversation right now, like you've been doing that, but also been really focused on anti-sexism and I really believe they're all like symptoms of the same disease, right? And right. like, I love how Dan Savage says, like, if you uh, are homophobic, you probably also mistreat women, right? It's, it's all mm-hmm. symptoms of the, the same mm-hmm. disease of like not seeing other people as equal inherently and um, not being compassionate. And your mm-hmm. work is getting to that root cause of all of those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Well, so let's um, move on to the next one. Yeah. Unless you have the anything next, else you want to say. The, no, no. The next one was um, developing a key question to check my motivations to avoid being performative. <laughs> so that's a funny. big assignment too. That's a big assignment. You should give it to oh. everybody right now who's on social media. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So so again, what's funny is when I when I read this question yesterday in our home team meeting, I said check the question a key question to check your motivation motivation to avoid perfectionism. Because oh. perfectionism is oh. one of my forms of fuckery. Me too. Right. Yes. And so I was like, huh, I'm surprised to talk about perfectionism with Ciara because I've worked on that a lot. So it wasn't until I went back and read some of our other notes that I was like, oh, no, to avoid being performative. And you actually, you already answered the question for me because my notes from when we talked were, you said, Lori, not being performative is actually really simple. That you ask, is my motive to bring attention to others and amplify others, or is it about bringing attention to me or making a sale? So that's a pretty simple question, right? Like, is is what I'm do, is what I'm posting, is what I'm representing, is it only about bringing clients to Radius because I want the money, or is it also about amplifying? Radius partners and other business that Radius works with and amplifying causes. And um, if someone doesn't know me or my business and they were to see this, what is the primary message that is coming through? Well, then we already answered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you answered it for me and it really sticks. So I think what I'll probably do is get a little sticky note and it'll sit right here at my desktop. And when I'm posting something and I'm like, oh crap, does this feel performative or not? Then that creates the little flow chart um, yeah. in my mind. Yeah, check your motives is always a, a good tool in many things. Mm -hmm. And then I just want to say really quickly on the perfectionism, you know, I think that, you know, say we have like four or five key areas of fuckery that we really need to work on. It doesn't mean that we eradicate them altogether, right? It just means right. that maybe like we can right size them for the situation because sometimes my perfectionism serves me really well. You yes. know, sometimes my, uh, you know, putting other people's needs first serves me well, you know, but it's mm -hmm. just about knowing when to let it off its leash and when to bring it in its case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the, what you said is knowing when, which means it's deliberate and intentional. When, when I hire you to redesign my website and do branding stuff, I want it to look pretty effing perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's what I love about, one of the many things I love about you is how thorough you are and have you, you have that eye for detail. It's for me, my perfectionism is when it stops execution because I'm worried that it has to be perfect. Um, that I'm worried that I cannot make mistakes, but I actually know that making mistakes is the only way that we learn. So I don't let my perfectionism paralyze me. All right, so the last one was designing a fall offering or drafting uh, what you wanna offer your clients next. Yes, so that one is one that is like still in process and maybe we can use our time together to, to look at that. So. The context was as the business is evolving and as I'm looking again at who our primary clients are and the primary work that we do and working in this COVID time when I'm no longer face to face with clients like I used to be, what is something that I could design? Let's see, our notes last time were putting together a program for the fall that is COVID friendly and then would also be virtually beyond Portland because of that. And, and then also thinking ahead about what are the services we offer in a September to May kind of a time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what, what is your place in the primary conversation that's going on right now, which is anti-racism. And I, um, <laughs> made the case to you that you it's not necessarily important that you step aside entirely um and i appreciate that like when people want dei training that you refer them to a people who are experts in that area 
and that you go out of your way to refer to uh, people of color, women of color, um, both for that work and for other work. But I don't think that you need to step aside altogether and like, <laughs> you know, I was saying, don't overdo it and not have a business at all because then you're not useful. It's fine for you to keep doing your work because yeah. it's complementary to that work, but you stay in your lane in terms of, you know, <laughs> not stealing a job from somebody and not, you yeah. know, and, and referring when it's appropriate, which you already do. But I think mm -hmm. you are overcorrecting. Yes, exactly. Um, which I see all the time in the clients that I work with, like, especially after I'll do a 360 and, um, and let's say uh, that somebody gets the feedback that they interrupt too much and they're too dominating and they need to be a better listener. So when they take that information really to heart, then they quit talking at all, <laughs> right? Which is sort of where I was spiraling into that, oh my gosh, I got feedback that I'm constantly interrupting, so I am going to sit in every meeting and only take notes. And no, that's overcorrecting because your voice and your opinions and your thoughts are still valuable. Just try not to talk over people. But I, I really wonder if that's part of the growth. Do we need to first overcorrect before we can sort of come back to somewhere in the center? Um, and I think I was so worried about either saying the wrong thing or um, centering myself that I wanted to like fully pull out of the work entirely. And only after I did that, can I come back and be like, okay, yeah, you're right, Ciara. Like, I'm not going to be that useful <laughs> if I'm not doing the work at all. So how can I continue to work with um, black and indigenous people of color and queer folks and women and, and folks who are not represented enough in business and in leadership and that collectively we do this work together. So um, there has been some growth since our last conversation two weeks ago. Good. Um, so what is thinking that? about putting it in action? Yes. Um, I already have a very long list of folks that I've either already some contracted with that um, do coaching work with Radius or provide um, workshop instruction with Radius. So wanting to check in again with them, what is their, what do they really want to be talking about now, right? Like in the past, I've used you for this, but what do you still want to be um, set up to talk about that topic or are there new fresh topics that you would like to be sort of like on the buffet or on the menu of radius. And then there's people that I've been meaning to pull in um, and I just haven't. So I think I always work better with really clear actions, right? So that next week I will contact three potential radius collaborators and ask them are you available in the fall? Would you be interested in being part of a online series? And what is your topic and what is your rate? And sort of going through all of those questions to see who's interested and in what context. Okay. Let's go back to the first half of that though, which is um, your current and past clients and checking in mm -hmm. with them. So what does mm -hmm. that look like? Is it that you want to design a custom thing for them or are we talking about a specific offering? Um, well, with a current client there, where there is still, um, budget in the purchase order, there was an understanding of the work that Radius would be doing in the curriculum in leadership development. And then because of COVID mainly, and um, a reduction in force, that's all been kind of put on hold. And part of the flexibility of working with us is if we have a clear scope and you want us to do this, but the world and the business changes, then we're willing to be like, package A is no longer exactly what you want. Let's morph it into something that's going to better suit your needs now. So we've had the conversations around putting things in hold and maybe um, looking at that again in the fall. I have not put forward, we could consider it doing this way. 
Um, so taking that next step to say this is what our scope could look like come fall would be a good place to start. Yeah, I think, you know, this is when you can put your consultant hat on and say, because, you know, back to the, <laughs> we'll just, we'll just keep switching metaphors, but back to the doctor analogy, you know, like now you've spent a lot of times with the sy symptoms, like maybe you've worked on like the root cause. Um, mm -hmm. And like you can write a prescription. Of course, you want to make sure it suits their lifestyle and, and their needs and their budget. But, um, right, you know, there's a lot of strength. And uh, in my experience, people always appreciate when you tell them exactly what they need and maybe give them a B option, you know, that mm -hmm. would respect time or respect money or something like that. But um, people like that. <laughs> yeah. Of course, with yeah. some questions asked. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so my notes are play consult, play both consultant and the doctor and writing a prescription being a bit more prescriptive than the Socratic me method that is my sort of primary form and saying, based on what's going on, I've been thinking that when we return to this in the fall, it could look like this and that I provide really clear options and they say yes, or, you know, basically I always put out a scope of work and say, please add, delete, edit, let's work on this together. But here's my first draft. And if that works for you, don't throw it away. But I just think there's a time for questioning, which is more of a coaching method. And there's a time for prescribing, which is more of a consulting right. method. And I think once you know, once you know a client's needs enough and you know their business enough, like that's the time to prescribe. Uh, yeah. when you're in the cell stage. Yeah, yeah. And that is the, my um, avoidance is too strong. My hesitation to get into prescription mode is my background in social work that comes forward, which believes so much in self-agency and people's self-determination and that I can give options, but that I can't tell people what to do. And so there are times when that social work in me, social worker in me really leads. And so maybe the language of, I'm gonna be more prescriptive than I tend to be. Um, yeah. And then saying it, because it will be a shift in how I show up and it mm -hmm. allows them to take it or leave it in a way that doesn't compromise my ethics. Yeah. Well, two things on that. I mean, A, I, um, I identify with that too, but I think especially if I'm selling other people, I can be way more heavy handed because I believe in them so much. And I think if you're talking yeah. about curating a series where you bring in other collaborators, yeah. um, it kind of gives you permission to really like hype them and say like, listen, you have to hear from this person. They're really going to change it for you. And it's yeah. easier just to sell other people sometimes. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah, totally hear that. Yeah. My, my notes are hype other collaborators because yeah. those are Ciara words, not Lori words. <laughs> yeah. You can have that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what was the other thing I was going to say? I lost it. I'll think of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's oh, what you know what it was is I think especially when you're not active with a client or, you know, a potential client. They like to know that you're thinking about their problems when you're not on the clock, you know? And if, if I right. call someone, I say, I've been thinking about you, or I've been thinking about your situation, or I've been thinking about your team, you know? And, and it's like, you're still putting in that, that time, yeah. even though the contract isn't active or something like that. That's really mm -hmm. meaningful because it shows mm -hmm. that you're a true partner and not just there to like collect the paycheck, right? And so yeah. preface by like, I've been thinking about how we can continue with this goal you have in light of a changed world and changed priorities. And I have some thoughts, like people mm -hmm. are gonna be so glad because they haven't probably had time to think about it because they're busy right. trying to adjust to all these new logistics of how we work in 2020. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so that's, that's my one larger corporate client. And then um, I have some other contracts with a small business and with a new executive director that are, um, rather than like a six month full coaching contract are like a 
three month, five or six session. And what I already realized, and this has been like brewing for a while, but that if, if you hire me to, to um, help you elevate a, a, a portion of your leadership or your business, and it's a really clearly defined goal and we're gonna be able to do it in a pretty short period of time. I guess this comes back to being prescriptive. Um, that if in our relationship becomes clear that there's this other need you have that is not a Lori specialty, that then I'm like, you know what? I think if you talked with Ciara, who's really good at this accountability and, and coming up with templates and her brain works in like linear ways that are much superior to mine, I would recommend that you work with Ciara on a couple of these things and, and that based on the situation that's either just like a straight out referral and then she continues to work with you or where it makes sense I say hey Ciara I'm working with Heidi and she'd love to work with you on on this one thing can you be under the radius umbrella what are your rates and and then it becomes a, a more robust part of radius packaging and Again, that's been something that I've been sort of toying with, but wanting to, I think if I have like my list of collaborators and what their area of expertise is, then when any of those things that come up with a coaching client, it's like, oh, I'm tag teaming Ciara in or Tori in or Cage in for this. And then the client's needs are better met. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a model I've been working on with, with pregame is that it's not about a personality. It's about a team. And I think it shows a lot of integrity that um, when you pass to somebody who maybe is more qualified to deal with a specific need than you are, first of all, um, I, and I think what I've experienced though, in actually selling it is that it can overwhelm people. <laughs> and so if you, um, come at it as like, we're going to get you exactly what you need. Let's clarify where you want to be at the end of this engagement. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you have 12 sessions and you're like, and in session seven and eight, you need to work with this person over here. Like people are just mm -hmm. glad because you're taking care. That's when you can prescribe right. also, you know, mm -hmm. it's like telling someone mm -hmm. to see a specialist. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally loving the doctor specialist metaphor. It works. And yeah. It comes back to relationship, right? Because if if I've been your coach and we've been working together for the last four sessions and all of a sudden I say, I'd like you to see Kathleen, you're going to be like, why would I see Kathleen? <laughs> um, I don't want to. I don't know her. But yeah. if, if, if it's all in the way we present it, you know, I think in, in two weeks after we meet one more time, I'd love to pull in Kathleen to work specifically on this particular thing. And um, I will be, I'm going to write some notes so that, so that Kathleen knows exactly why we're calling her in. And there's this whole baton passing really smoothly. Um, then it can work to lessen that sense of overwhelm that you bring up. Yeah, I think it also, like from a sales perspective, um, well, I use it one of two ways. Like, first of all, it's kind of like a guarantee. You know, sometimes people don't want to buy something, especially something that is like a, a more expensive or something because they're worried, like, what if I don't like it or what if I can't get out of it? And right. and it sort of acts like a guarantee of like, and you can change up the engagement within it, you know, when, once you're committed. Um yeah. And then the other, or, you know, or I'll use it as like a surprise and delight, like a bonus, like, <laughs> like special guest star this week, like I'm going to yeah. bring in, you know, so uh, like, so if I'm working with somebody on their marketing and I know somebody who has a specialization in that one area of their marketing strategy, yeah. like maybe I'll bring them in for a meeting and I'll stay there. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that can be good if you can afford the hour to stay in the session. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause then it feels like extra. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yes. All yes. And, <laughs> um, I think I need a question. Well, okay. I'll ask a question, which is always my best question. So if we're meeting, I mean, it's the second day of the quarter of the third quarter. 
So if we're meeting on the second day of the fourth quarter and you've had an awesome quarter, mm. what have you accomplished? Thank you. That's the question I needed. Yeah. <laughs> um, that I have clarified um, beyond the current list of radius collaborators that I've done the most collaboration with over the last couple of years that I have um, a clear list of collaborators and subcontractors who are at the ready with um, with a primary set of workshops or coaching skills or topics and there's an um, a clear understanding of how they will work with radius and in what context and that we will be um we will be serving existing and new clients with a greater, more robust set of services that Radius delivers. That still needs a lot of refinement. <laughs> yeah, it does. That's okay, let's do it. With your expanded list, I'm just thinking of it as like expanding the menu. Why? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to, why? Why? Because while I already contract with a lot of women-owned business and queer-owned business and people of color that I want to amplify more black and brown businesses and black and brown business leaders. And I want to, um, I, I realized about six months ago that while I still want to do the work, that part of what I really, really love is curating the work and pulling together the right panel and pulling together the right set of workshops and pulling together the right coaching team to meet each business need. And that that feels like putting a puzzle together, like, oh yes, these people are gonna love Daisha and oh yes, these people are gonna love Katie and oh yes, they're totally ready for Ciara. And you know, that, that there is no one size fits all. That's always been a really important component of Radius. And so why? Because it's really fun and because it means that client needs are being better addressed. Okay. Okay, so to that point, Um, what's the advantage of having that menu ready before there's a need for it? Hmm. Um, I think because it would feel like a greater step than I've had in the past because conceptually I've been wanting to do this for a while, but mm -hmm. it just hasn't been executed. Why? I'm not totally sure. Here's my point. So like in, you know, lean methodology, like one of the pillars of that is like just in time. Mm. Um, so, you know, you order the, the part just in time. You, you don't do anything until it's really necessary. And even then at the very last minute, right? Yeah. Because um, even in a service business, we run the risk of wasting time creating a product before we've sold the product. And I always say right. sell it before you create it. Um, and not as much for you, more for like people who are earlier on, they'll spend, you know, months and months designing a retreat or designing an online course or, or some sort of service offering, and then no one buys it. So they could have known no one was going to buy it if they had just worked on completing the marketing copy and so sold it. And then once uh -huh. Once people buy it, then do the curriculum, you know, <laughs> just right. schedule it for it out. So, right. um, so I just want to get to the motivation of this. Like, is this about, I mean, honestly, do you feel guilty? You don't have more people of color on your roster or do you feel like, um, I'm definitely going to sell this. I want to have it ready to go. Or like, I just enjoy knowing more people and what they can do and feeling like, I can go out there and broker them. You know, it's like if you mm -hmm. if you are an agent, like a talent agent, 
Um, mm -hmm. Is it about having a good stable that you can bring to people? You know, just because mm -hmm. you don't, of course, you don't want to get into a situation where someone's like, oh yeah, I want to buy stuff. And then you don't have any stuff to sell them. But um, I don't want you to be creatively avoiding doing business development. <laughs> yes. Um, well, okay. So the just in time resonates. And I think this goes back to why haven't I done it before? I'm feeling more adrenaline and momentum to pull this from concept idea stage to actually elevating and amplifying other businesses that, mm -hmm. that this is how I, I have, a lot of social capital. I have more social capital than I have wealth. And I want to use all of my social capital, all of my existing client contacts, past and present, to say, you valued what Radius provided, what Lori provided, and Radius is so much bigger than just Lori and what Lori can bring. And that this is one tangible way that I can elevate additional other businesses. Okay, so to skip to the end, like I like to do, <laughs> is then the goal is you need to decide for this company that you run of your roster, what do you want the demographic to look like or the skill set spread to look like, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to update that. So the goal is, like, say your roster right now has five people on it, five other coaches or consultants that you can mm -hmm. call in. And it's four women, one man, and you're great with the 80%. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But say it's, like, 40% people of color and 60% white people, and you're like, oh, I'd like it to be more than half. Then your only goal, mm -hmm. then, is to add two more people of color. Right. So mm -hmm. you can, so that's just a very specific and actionable goal mm -hmm. that you can have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then the second part of that goal is to, and this is what I think other businesses are going through right now, really get clear on the terms where everyone feels very well taken care of and not taken advantage of mm -hmm. once so that you can go out and confidently broker things and not run into any problems, you know, with any of our own, it's just really important to be extra careful right now and making sure yeah. it wants to take care of. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so that makes the goal like much <laughs> more actionable and um, a lot easier, I think too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, the other element is of this is, because of the times we live in and like I, I'm paid out of a learning and development budget typically um, if it's a larger company and that finally um, more businesses are putting down the money to hire equity and inclusion specialists and that's awesome and hopefully they're hiring people of color to do that work and also as you know people of color, black and brown people of color, um, do more than just equity and inclusion work. Yeah. So I would like for my clients who are freaking out because they don't know any black people um, or because they don't know how to find um, a, a Latinx educator, that I know lots of people outside the equity and inclusion space that are also underrepresented, especially in tech, where I do so much work, so that I can help my clients to bring in multiple perspectives beyond just equity and inclusion work. So yeah. that's also what part of the motivation is. I love that. Like that, that's a little bit of a different angle. And um, it, it's very accurate to what you bring them already. And I don't think you're stepping on toes especially because you have existing relationships with a lot of people. And, and like we talked about last mm. time, um, you know, how can you make it a win-win? There are people who don't have your business development skills who would really benefit from somebody going to bat for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you're not taking business from somebody else who would otherwise be getting it. Like you're helping someone else better learn how to interact 
and mm -hmm. sell and deliver services in a corporate space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which leads me back to what we talked about earlier, that I, uh, I came out of the gates being really loud and sort of like, um, fuck it, I'm, I'm quitting all of my jobs. Fuck corporate America. <laughs> like, I can't work for the man anymore. We all um, felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I'm going back to nonprofits. Um, I'm going to sell my house and live out of my camper. Like, you know, like the whole thing that like maybe 20 year olds do that I'm not sure I can do so easily as a 45 year old. <laughs> so yeah. That was sort of what? My first thriller, like nonprofits have all these problems too, right? Yes, right. Oh, absolutely do they ever, right? Because it's not about which sector, it's the fact that we live in America under white supremacy and that shows up absolutely everywhere. So there is no running from it. So, well, and all the other ahead. kinds of privilege too, right? And, um, right. I know, I know, and it's so important, obviously, that anti-racism is the primary conversation right now, but you still represent an, a disadvantaged group, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe several for some ones I don't know about. So, like, mm -hmm. you're still qualified to speak from the perspective of somebody who doesn't have privilege in certain areas, especially mm -hmm. in tech, right, which is very mm -hmm. male-dominated. So, mm -hmm. um, you don't need to entirely discount your experience. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and back to like showing up with intention and not showing up from some um, overreactive kind of a place. Right. And, and so much of my work is around helping people to regulate their emotions so that we're um, not being reactive, we're being responsive. And of course I'm not immune from being reactive um, no matter how much work I do. And so part of the reason I agreed to tape this coaching call is because it feels really important that if I believe in coaching, that I'm demonstrating that I'm also willing to be coached the same way that I really believe in therapy. And so I go to therapy mm -hmm. um, and that all of us need that sounding board and thought partner and someone else to help us clarify our vision and clarify our goals and be able to actually take steps forward. Why do you believe in coaching? Um, I believe in coaching because nobody knows everything. And I believe that all of us um, need people to hear us and see us and listen to us and see our best strengths. And I came into the coaching work from a more clinical therapeutic setting. And I, I believe very much in that value. The reason I have stayed in coaching is because I get to bring a lot of those gifts learned as a social worker into workspaces. And some of my greatest suffering has been by really under the thumb of really abusive bosses. And I believe that leaders in any business, regardless of their title, um, have an incredible ability to impact others. And that to help people lead with greater self-awareness and greater connection to themselves and acknowledgement of their own fuckery helps there be less fuckery at work and in the world. Well, good thing we're recording this because you might be able to listen to that. <laughs> I came up with your fall marketing campaign slogan while you said that. Oh, awesome. <laughs> You're always so good at that. I always get a bonus with you. <laughs> yeah. No, but that was my next question though, is like, what's the marketing campaign for this? And, it, you know, which might just be business development conversations with people I already know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think I want to challenge you and it doesn't necessarily mean you don't already know everyone, but I'm sure you have some 
companies or people at companies that you have a budding relationship with that it's still worth having some business development conversations as you get back in the groove, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it can't hurt. And it's a good discipline because it gives you the opportunity to do more of what you love and create more opportunities for some of these other people that you want to bring in. Yeah. 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 Well, and I, I'm, I'm eager to hear what the, the marketing campaign is. The other thing that came to me as I was prepping for your call, which um, to plug coaching, yours or mine, is that even before I show up on a call with you, it means that I've gone back and I've looked at my notes and I've looked at what you've told me previously and I've just in time done my homework before we have a call. But then it means I'm going to have probably have some epiphanies or aha moments before we even hop on the call because I've gone back to the notes, right? And now I've taken a previous conversation and applied it to previous context. And when I was going back to my why, um, which you didn't even specifically ask me to do, but I did just because it's important to return to it. And I realized that the, the sort of primary expression I've been using for how I work is the sum of success factors in your, in your own leadership or in your business is divided by fuckery. So if you want to be more successful, you have to reduce fuckery in the denominator. And I realized that it's not just success that I want to help you with. It is also what else is on that numerator is whatever you're doing to create belonging, whatever you're doing to create equity, whatever you're doing to create justice, in your life and in your work, all of that is divided by fuckery. So it's not just success. And, and it made me think of sort of the, the pillars of the um, B cores around planet, profit, and planet, that success is often connotated around our profit and are we a successful money-making business. But that the people part is about the belonging. And I want to help people foster greater belonging where they work. And then the planet part of the B Corps um, or the triple bottom line is, is to me justice. If we are living in a world where there is greater equity and equality and inclusion, that also, that's across systems. Every, every person and every system benefits from that. Yeah. So, um, here are some collections of words. I can email them to you. Okay. <laughs> they they seem like email newsletter subject lines to me. <laughs> or okay. I mean, they could be blog posts. But what I heard you say before is bad bosses cause suffering, mm -hmm. which is really blunt and, and juicy, I think. Mm. You could also reverse it to the positive where say something like good bosses reduce suffering or mm -hmm. <laughs> self-awareness is the key. Mm -hmm. um, something you've said over like the last year that I think uh, you could, you could really amplify in your helping people get to know you is, is that you're driven by aha moments, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I live for the aha moments, you know, I think that's mm -hmm. interesting because I think a lot of other people, do too, but maybe they've lost it in the routine mm -hmm. of their jobs. Mm. Um, and then, and then the one I got from what you just said was fuckery dilutes your results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> or you could say it makes you impotent. Oh yeah. Then you'll really get attention of your target. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yeah, there's that's a, yeah. powerful. There's a visual in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, it does, and that, it's a powerful visual. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, everything we're talking about is true to your brands too, which is radius, which is mm -hmm. what is the full circle. Mm -hmm. Full circle approach. You can't get a full circle solution necessarily with one workshop or one right. person even, you know, like this right. is another way we are bringing you full circle 
to look at every aspect or every dimension. Right. So there's a right. lot of play on, play on that concept that you can do. Um, yeah. with, with a few minutes left, let's um, see if we can put a little more uh, measurability into your Q3 goals. I've been writing down, um, but I'm curious if you want to give it a go. Well, one of the things is um, with the existing client with the open PO to um, advise how we use the rest of that PO in reshaping uh, the body of work that I was originally um, uh, hired to do um, while that's on hold. So that's something that I'll work on um, uh, due dates um, before July 10th. And... <clears throat> As I update my roster, um, looking at those percentages and getting really clear about um, who's on the roster, why they're on the roster, um, and wrapping some dates around that. Um, that's by August 15th. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's two prong goal. Like, what do I want the makeup of my team to be? Mm -hmm. And how can I add to edit that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I love having a, a due date on that. Uh, what are some actions you, you see for me? Yeah, I just was writing down things like contact three potential radius collaborators, find out their topics, their rate, their availability, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. what are their terms. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you might talk to somebody who is an agent, a natural talent agent, hmm. because it would be an interesting contact. Like I, I have a contact who is an agent for um, thought leader speakers, like nonfiction business authors. Hmm. Like she would be a great person to just talk to, you know, yeah. um, or I have a friend who, who was a talent agent um, and I'm happy to introduce you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then I, I just want you to define your mark. I mean, you've been doing awesome on content. So I want you to write down like what your content habits are for your marketing goal. Cause I know you're, you're doing them. Um, but sometimes that, since they're not really ingrained habits, they've only been going for a few months. Now mm -hmm. is a good time to uh, define mm -hmm. how you're going to maintain them. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think you need to change anything. I think you're doing great. Okay. Um, and then for your sales goal, your business development, just just define those habits of <clears throat> the number of conversations or how many people or how often you're you're reaching out because you mm -hmm. did that really well too in the past of like this many coffees or, you know, right. you can probably, you can probably look back on that um, and see which ones were worthwhile mm -hmm. and how much energy you have this, this year in the summer too. Right. Right. Well, and I was really good at um, both making the business development contacts and recording them in my calendar pre-COVID. And yeah. then when all of a sudden I stopped having coffee with people and I was like, I don't want to do this via Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> and there was this long period um, where that didn't happen. And then in summer, there's just not as much structure in my life in general because I'm married to a teacher, but realizing that I need to return to that habit of specifically don't, identifying. Don't blame your husband for your lack of structure. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you, Ciara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I yeah, can't eat healthy because my kids eat Oreos. Yes, you can. It's harder, <laughs> but you can. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, getting back to those good habits. And then the last thing I just want to bring up because I'm I'm guessing you probably already are doing this or thinking about it um, in light of everything going on, especially is like some sort of philanthropy goal for your mm -hmm. impact goal, like whether you mm -hmm. are doing a pro bono workshop for community warehouse, which you love or right. donating a percentage of some certain projects coming up to, you know, an anti-racist organization or something. Like, I think that would be mm -hmm. really true to who you are and, and maybe give you that much more um, drive to go have those conversations. So think about 
yeah. how you want to incorporate those things, um, whether you're donating time or money um, mm -hmm. or social capital to a cause that you believe in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you. And and that was in is in the works, but um, to be uh, only because of working with you previously around an impact goal and that I've set quarterly goals around which nonprofits and causes I contribute time and money to um, and uh, looking at how I do that in even more expansive ways in light of what's going on. Awesome. Thank you so much for this. You're so welcome. Thank you. And I will see you next week. Okay. Bye, Ciara. Bye.